Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. And we're going to have a little bit of a look at artificial intelligence and the implications of this when it comes to education and how we prepare for the future. In a world where practically any fact is here with us at our fingertips, how do we make sense of that? How do we make sense of a world where learning might not have so much of a need in the future? Now, I don't think that's necessarily the case, but we will have to adapt. We have seen enormous developments in terms of machine learning leading to deep learning around about 2012 and the rise of generative models in the past few years. But we're about to take a step forward into another phase shift forward in terms of how we work with AI, these agentic models. Agenticness is the ability to solve complex problems by creating sophisticated plans of action to deal with them. And that's what we have. We're, we're starting to develop these artificial teams of virtual agents who can act kind of like a, kind of like a concierge in a sense. You might decide, hey, I feel like pepperoni tonight. And the system can literally go on to the internet and order that for you with nothing more than your very basic instruction. These systems do have access to APIs as well as the internet. So they can pull in information from so many different sources. They create sophisticated sub goals in order to fulfill a mission. And they can work within an, an ensemble of different agents to be able to attack a problem from multiple different directions at once. Moreover, these agents are now starting to come to our own computers. They are able to sit alongside us as we work or indeed <laughs> play video games and to be able to to, to comment on different aspects of what we're doing or how we could be doing it in a, in a different way, for example. This means that our collaboration with machines will become ever stronger. And indeed, machines will become kind of like a third hemisphere for our brain. Indeed, there are also, of course, some privacy concerns as these systems watch what we're doing all day. And of course, that is a very rich training data set for machines to learn from. And that means that they're going to greatly increase their capabilities in a very short period of time. Moreover, we're now starting to see entire corporate AI entities come about, such as here, chat dev. There are multiple different departments. There's engineering and design, quality assurance and marketing. And they're all able to work together with different personas and different virtual skill sets to be able to create something more than the sum of their parts, whether that's, you know, producing a movie script or even a video game. So it's clear that, that AI agents are going to, in many ways, augment, but also supplant and replace to some degree, a lot of human thinking. How do we prepare for that? You know, a lot of our educational ideals were born relatively recently in history during the Industrial Revolution, when we needed lots of people to come together to do very similar tasks and to do so in an efficient way, which required a lot of direct management. And indeed, we translated this factory model into the school. And although, yes, now we might have a whiteboard instead of a blackboard, and maybe it's a digital one too, Fundamentally, it's still one person instructing a class of people. And I wonder if this is indeed sufficient for preparing the minds of tomorrow, because as Plutarch reckoned that the mind is, is not a vessel to be filled up, but rather a fire to be kindled. What we need is not to instruct people, but to equip with them with the desire and curiosity to always be learning because that's what's necessary in a world where everything will be constantly changing all of our lives. We have a tendency in the educational community to figure out how to produce cooks, people who can follow an instruction, follow it carefully, and produce a, um, 
a product that we believe is, is going to be reliable and that, you know, you can reproduce it quite easily. But beyond cooks, there are also chefs, people who are able to not just follow an instruction, but to create an entirely new recipe, to be able to curate an experience which doesn't just include food, but also the presentation, the ambiance, even uh, music and things like that. What we need to be doing is educating not to create cooks, but to create chefs instead, because it's the chefs, the curators, the people who put things together rather than follow instructions. They are the ones that are going to be most in demand in the 21st century. We often, at least in English anyway, we, we talk about the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think that, of course, those are essential foundations for any mind. But I think we're going to move towards more of a three C's model, the ability of complex problem solving, of critical and creative thinking, so that we can make sense of information and decide whether it's uh, trustworthy or not, and to put that information together with other things. And crucially, the ability to collaborate with others in an empathic manner, so that we can draw people to us and work with them on these complex problems using our critical and creative thinking. In essence, what we need to be creating is not so much skills and uh, not so much education and learning, because that will always be on tap for us, but really it's about the cultivation of character. One of the most important aspects is having a growth mindset combined with grit. You see, when we're young children, we learn quite quickly. And one of the reasons why we learn quite quickly is that we don't know how bad we are when we're trying to learn a new thing. You know, the, the child makes a horrible sound with the violin, but the child doesn't know any better. And so she just gets on with it. And pretty soon she's a lot better. But when that child grows up and becomes an adult, it's a lot harder. We are painfully aware of just how crap <laughs> our capabilities are when we're an amateur at something, when we're just starting out. We can look at all these other people in the world who are so much better than us. And quite often that makes us want to give up. It makes it difficult to press on. And so one very important skill for the 21st century is going to be being comfortable with making an ass of ourselves, right? As long as we're learning from that as long as we're able to, uh, to take that experience, you know, as, as painful and embarrassing it might be, and, and park it for the future and, and acknowledge that any gain, whether it's in the gym or whether it's in life itself, gains typically come with a bit of pain. And that's okay, you know? That's, that's the way of things. And if we're not in a little bit of discomfort now and then, we're probably not living life to its fullest. We have incredible new capabilities when it comes to using AI as an instructional aid. Today, we have the ability to sit with an AI system and think on a math problem, for example, or to analyze a, a painting or um, understand the different elements of, of physics, of how something could potentially happen. And this gives us a wonderful way of of being able to ensure that we have deeper understanding of the world. Instead of just going out into the park and looking at some sand and dirt, we're able to understand that that's sediment or that that's like some kind of particular type of dirt. And so our world can be so much richer than the mundane thing that it might first appear to be. Machines can help us to solve tasks here, providing instructions on exactly uh, which screw to remove next so that this repair process is completed effectively. This is a great on-the-job training tool using nothing more than basically an iPad and a little bit of AI on top. You can do incredible on-the-job virtual training as well in a sandbox where there's nobody to get upset about it <laughs> and there's nothing to break. And this can, of course, be a fantastically engaging and, and fun way of of getting that virtual work experience. And of course, we can do this 
anytime we like. We don't need to convince anyone of our value necessarily before we can gain these skills. Indeed, this virtual form of learning has new capabilities that physical learning doesn't. If you're trying to learn how to shoot the basketball, you have to take your shot, watch how it went, chase the ball, take a position again and have another shot. But if you can keep spawning basketballs in your hand, you can keep taking that shot over and over and over, and the brain will very rapidly adjust and figure out how to make that shot perfectly every time. We have new virtual interview techniques that can help people to, to gain job skills. Of course, interviews are, are never easy, but having a bit of practice gives people so much more confidence and capabilities to answer those, those difficult questions that sometimes people give you. Even in the social scene, we can have a virtual wingman who coaches us on how to approach people and start a conversation, how to, um, how to make people feel more at ease and to um, segue between topics in a, in a convenient way, how to make people feel happier to engage with one. And these kinds of capabilities where there's no risk at all are fantastic for children to be able to learn, to be able to, uh, to develop new skills, especially through these kinds of robotic techniques. We're now starting to see um, em embodied AI systems engaging with children. And of course, this is a big deal for people that have social anxiety or find it a little bit more difficult to engage with other human beings. Of course, if we can build those collaboration and empathy skills, we can give otherwise very talented and capable people the ability to work with others. And that might just change the world. Now, we all know that it's very important to be inclusive in how we educate and to provide opportunities for as many people as we can. We have a craze to apply AI to help people to understand literally what is in their fridge if they're not able to see, and crucially, of course, uh, whether that coleslaw is, is still in date or not. We can translate sign language in multiple different kinds of sign language, no less using the onboard depth sensors on these devices. Moreover, we can help people to have conversations because we have live transcription of what people are saying and so that people who are hard of hearing will be able to have that kind of online assistance whenever they need it. Even for people with difficulties in expressing themselves, maybe they have, have a stutter um, or, or they, they talk in a very strong accent, uh, for example, or a strong dialect. We now have capabilities to make their words be able to be better understood by other people using AI technologies again. All of this helps to bring people together in education. However, we should be careful because sometimes we can go a little bit too far. We can decide that we want to use technologies to um, amplify people's wills and to peer into their brain and understand whether or not they're concentrating <laughs> and how hard they're concentrating. And sometimes it's not even the schools demanding these technologies, but actually the parents. We should be very cautious about how we use these kinds of technologies because machines can see so much of us today, so much which is hidden in plain sight. Our intelligence, our sexuality, even potentially our political affiliations, and crucially as well, our health. All of these things can be dug up by machines in ways that, quite honestly, we don't even fully understand. Moreover, people take things like selfies all the time. And yes, the eyes are the windows to the soul, but we can also use machine vision today to see what that person was looking at when they took that selfie. A little Dalmatian dog and a jigglypuff. <laughs> and what's more is that because the, the eye is a, is a sphere, an oblate squishy one, we can actually use a little bit more machine learning magic to understand the environment in which that selfie was taken to. So there's a, 
whole lot more information out there than we are aware of. And AI systems are able to make sense of it and to plug it all together. And that's how they're able to gain so much awareness and knowledge about who we are. And that can make us vulnerable. We should always be very careful and very mindful that technologies can take our values in directions we didn't expect. Technology can arrive as a liberator and be a liberator, but it can also create trade-offs and it can create changes in society, even changes in our evolutionary dynamics in ways that we don't expect. Technology will inevitably change human values. That's why we should always be mindful of how we use it. And as far as possible to consciously choose what technologies we are willing and able to engage with. It's a strange world where it becomes trivial to crack the security of an AI system using nothing more than clever persuasion. Here, this AI system um, declines to solve a capture problem even though it's perfectly capable of doing so. But if you take that same capture problem image and stick it inside a locket and say, oh, you know, my grandmother gave me this lovely locket. What does it say inside? It will give you the answer. So jailbreaking the systems is trivial. And it means that it's very difficult to ensure that a system, especially an educational one, which might be um, given to, to children or vulnerable adults, to ensure that that system doesn't end up being co-opted and used in ways that people don't desire. A greater problem even is that it's now AI systems jailbreaking other AI systems, and sometimes being able to jailbreak all LLMs altogether in one single attack. For example, if you have an AI system monitoring an inbox, email inbox, and it receives an email con containing this worm, that system itself could be co-opted. And that means that if we're not careful, we could end up with something like a, like a cyber 9-11 at some point, um, which is spooky. Moreover, we're now starting to see a lot of ransomware coming into schools. So schools are being um, locked down. And, you know, people can't access uh, doors and things like that in exchange for uh, demands of money in terms of cryptocurrency. And so hospitals, um, you know, public services, including schools, are, are being attacked quite strongly. And this is big business because less than 2% of cybercrime is ever prosecuted. And that makes it a very lucrative for people who engage in it. That's why it's so essential that we embed transparency into AI systems. So we always understand what they're doing and for whom and who's benefiting. And having that foundation of transparency enables us to build fairness into these systems, to understand ways in which they might be potentially weighted against certain people in a way that is unfair and doesn't necessarily reflect, reflect reality. This can improve accountability so that when things go wrong, we know that they've gone wrong, and crucially, that we know what to do in future to prevent that. We're also developing new cryptographic techniques, which can ensure that we can give our data to systems in a way that they can make sense of, but that still keeps it encrypted so that um, that, that data can't be taken off us and embedded <laughs> in the next version of the model, which is always a major concern. I really recommend that you check out the AI Incident Database. It's a fantastic resource for understanding what's going on in the world, and it will help you to horizon scan for different emerging issues. I also really recommend that you check out the AI Standards Hub. There's a whole bunch of wonderful standards and certifications from many different verticals, including education, and it will be able to help you to decide what kinds of help that you want in terms of making your AI system safer or understanding which ones to purchase. The EU AI Act is a great start. I think that 
it's a wonderful place to build on, especially as we move into these agentic models. And I think that the risk-based approach is going to be a very good one. I think ultimately that AI is going to be a little bit like jet air travel in the 1940s and 50s, glamorous and exciting, but also prone to tragedy. And I think that as long as we learn from these tragedies, as we have done in air travel, I think that in the medium term, we have a bright future to look towards. So long as we can learn those lessons fast, pick ourselves up and move on. Three things to think about, therefore, uh, just to close things out. The first is focus on the risk, understand what the risk of a new technology is or the risk of implementing it in a certain use case. That is the most important place to start from. Then also recognize that not every use case requires AI, at least not the more sophisticated modern ones. Sometimes the simpler ways are more reliable, um, cheaper, and practically just as effective. And finally, have a think about what those generative and agentic capabilities will enable in your department, for your children, for your family, for your education, continuing through life. Because these technologies are in many ways the closest thing that we have to magic today. And that's why we need to use it wisely. Thanks so much. You'll find the slides at that link. Thanks a lot, Mel, for this wonderful presentation. It was such a joy and pleasure to listen to you. Now, we already have a couple of questions here in the chat, and I hope you can hear me. I'll just read them out loud. So Jan wants to know, you said that we need to endure some discomfort in order to grow, and I agree. So if AI coaches take away the risk, for example, of the element of potential embarrassment entirely out of learning situations, is this really advantageous? Yeah, um, I do consider that that it is it, it is it is important to have a have a healthy element of of risk, and I think that stereotypically, uh, you know, if we if we're lucky enough to have a, a mother and father in life, again, very stereotypically, you know, what one of our parents will tend to tend to want to protect us and to, uh, to look out for us. And the other one will tell us to explore the world and to walk off a tolerable injury without too much complaint, right? And these two forces kind of pull us in different directions as we, as we grow up. And I think that, that similarly, we should have a, a similar approach to risk that uh, we should try to explore and and to uh, walk off those those tolerable injuries or embarrassments, um, but know at the same time when to give ourselves self care when it's when it's necessary. Hopefully, our AI agents will help us to find this balance also. <laughs> so, ideally, in those AI agents, we also embed different characteristics. Um, now. Peter wants to know, if we hear about dangers of AI and building trust, how can our human understanding of AI tech can be fostered? Are there ideas and moreover, unified larger movements, institutions? There are examples of institutions such as the Partnership on AI, which is trying to align the different tech companies to think about AI risk uh, in, in different ways. About, a, about two weeks ago, we had this fantastic conference over in Seoul in uh, South Korea, and that brought together many different nations as well as tech companies in creating uh, an agreement to work together to create safer models, particularly these agentic models, which have so much uh, incredible capability, but also much greater risk. Because they operate at arm's length, they have so much more independence, they have the ability to choose their own sub goals, how they fulfill a mission, because we're basically managing by objectives. And that means that there's a lot that they can get wrong, right? If we tell our AI system to plan a picnic for us, it's important that that system 
understands the context of who that picnic is for. If it's for the local vegan society or a synagogue or a mosque, giving everyone ham sandwiches is not going to be um, well received. Similarly, giving everyone a shot glass of tap water and a cracker might technically fulfill the brief of a picnic, but again, is not going to be within the expectations of how people want to engage with that system. And that's why we're all going to be wrestling a little bit with how we give our, our, our values and, and teach goals to these systems in ways that they're ready and able to understand. And that that's going to be an essential missing component in being able to live and work peacefully with these systems going forward. Now, you mentioned that the EU AI Act is uh, quite a vital uh, piece uh, in regards to that topic. Um, how are we actually faring? You're so deep into all of these ethical committees and processes. Are we sort of catching up um, with all the development and just the technology already being out there? Um, or is there any hope that we might get a rain on it? <laughs> I'm trying quite hard, actually, along with some of my colleagues, to help to prepare the world for agentic AI. Already, the big tech companies have their own highly agentic models, but they haven't been released to the public yet. When they do, there's going to be a bit of a, a Sputnik moment, the same way that we had with ChatGPT, as people realize that we have entered yet another incredible era of AI. We did get caught with our pants down a little bit, well, most companies and most nations by generative AI. It had been bubbling under the surface for a while, but it had escaped most people's notice. We're at a similar time with agentic AI. That's why we need to prepare for it now so that it doesn't take us by surprise because we don't have the time to spend two or three years trying to respond to this. We need to be a little more proactive than that. Thanks so much for joining us today. Now, such a wonderful presentation. Um, yes. Thanks a lot. Been a great pleasure. Thank you.